Liebe Zuschauer, ich darf Ihnen heute den Vortrag einer ganz herausragenden Wissenschaftlerin und Persönlichkeit ankündigen. Dr. Jane Goodall, die Direktorin des Gombe Forschungsinstituts in Tansania, ist zu einer lebenden Legende geworden. Über 30 Jahre erforschte sie Familienstrukturen und Verhalten wild lebender Schimpansen in einem Waldgebiet im Nordwesten Tansanias. Dabei fand sie heraus, dass diese Tiere im Prinzip die gleichen Anlagen wie wir besitzen. Sie können denken, planen, lernen, lieben und trauern. Bei der Erziehung ihres eigenen Sohnes, so sagt die gebürtige Engländerin, habe sie sich am liebevollen Stil der Schimpansenmutter Flo orientiert, von der im folgenden Beitrag auch die Rede sein wird. Seit der Lebensraum ihrer Schützlinge bedrohlich schrumpft, kämpft Jane Goodall mit Vortragsreisen und Initiativen für bessere Lebensbedingungen der Schimpansen. Ihr Vortrag erfolgt in Englisch mit deutscher Übersetzung. In fact, I decided to try to give you some flavor for what it's been like to work with, to understand, to live with such amazing beings as chimpanzees for now 30 years. And the best way to give you this flavor is to go through some of the family history of the individual chimpanzees whom I've come to know so well. I think it's incredibly remarkable that not only is each chimpanzee different, not only does each one have a personality quite as unique as yours and mine, but also within one community, in one small area of Africa, Gombe National Park in Tanzania, Chimpanzees can grow up having completely different life histories. And that I always find remarkable. And it's only when we examine the whole 30-year sweep that we begin to get a feeling for how very remarkable some of these differences are. So if we can have the lights out, we will go to the world of Gombe that I probably know better than the world here. Gombe National Park, a very tiny area on the east and most extreme of the chimpanzees range. They go right across the equatorial forest belt from western central Africa as far as the Great Rift. Just east of Lake Tanganyika is where we find Gombe National Park. It's only 30 square miles. It goes inland only to the peaks of the Rift Escarpment that you see up there and for about 10 miles along the lake shore. When I first got to Gombe, the chimpanzees were very frightened of me. They ran off even if I was 500 meters away. But gradually, because I sat up on one of the open peaks between the thickly forested valleys, they got used to this peculiar white-skinned ape who had invaded their territory. I went through a difficult time when they became, instead of frightened, aggressive, but eventually they learned to accept and finally to trust me. The chimpanzees have a very unusual social structure, different from almost all of the other non-human primates. They don't travel around in a constant, semi-stable troop or group like gorillas and baboons and most of the monkeys. They live in communities, 50 to 60 individuals, which are usually six to 10 fully adult males, about twice as many females, and the rest are adolescents, juveniles, and youngsters. But the members of this community, although they may all interact sometimes, don't travel around together. They travel rather in small groups, such as you see here, females and young, sometimes groups of adult males, and sometimes mixed groups. Females, particularly as they get older, spend a great deal of time traveling around by themselves, just accompanied by their youngsters. Here we have a typical small mixed group of three adult males, David Greybeard, Mr. McGregor, and Hugo. And then we have two of the families that I want to talk about this evening. I've just selected two. I could tell you 10 different family histories, all quite uh, unique. But I've picked that of old Flo, her daughter Fifi, Flo's son Flint, you can just see him somewhere on her lap. And when this picture was taken, Flo had two older sons, Fabian and Figan, who are not in this picture. 
And then over here we have a piece of Melissa, the other female whom I want to talk about, who in this picture is pregnant. Now I've said the chimps move around in small groups, sometimes joining up. There is contact between these small groups. The chimpanzees have a distance call, and what you see them doing here is tan hooting. <laughs> has his or her own distinctive voice and that means that if you hear a call like that and these chimps are indeed answering a call from across the valley you know not just there are chimps over there you know exactly who is calling and based upon that you can then make a decision do I reply or stay quiet do I go and join them do I stay where I am or do I go quietly in the opposite direction and this is a very fascinating aspect of chimpanzee social life. They are constantly having to make decisions about who to travel with and where to go. And now, just to recap this early piece of history, which some of you may remember, we don't have time to go into all the fascinating details of these two family histories, but this picture was taken at Flo in 19, let's see, 1960. Seven. Flint is five years old. Flo is very old indeed. She's probably somewhere over 40. The life expectancy in captivity is over 50 years. But in the wild, I suspect 45 is very old. We thought no presently. Flint has not been properly weaned after Flo gives birth to her last infant. You can see the infant's hands and feet. And when a new baby is born, the previous child, who's five or six years old, is normally independent to the extent that he or she will travel around with the mother still, but make their own nest at night and travel under their own steam, no longer riding on the mother. But here Flint, perhaps because Flo was so old that she seemed not to have the strength to properly wean him, he remains abnormally dependent on his mother. When that new baby was six months old, she died. She died while Flo herself was so sick that she was unable to climb trees. We don't know what happened to the baby. Flint regained his cheerful nature. He'd become very depressed during his sister's life, but he remained abnormally dependent on his old mother. Flo, taken just a couple of weeks before she died, We've never seen a female or a male at Gombe who looked older than Flo. And as I say, I suspect she was somewhere around 45, maybe even older. And Flint still had this abnormal relationship with his old mother. He was still constantly with her. By now, he's eight and a half years old. He's still sleeping in her nest at night, still trying to ride her back, although she's not strong enough to carry him. And when she died, she was alone with Flint, and it seemed that Flint was unable to live after losing his mother. He fell into a depression. He showed signs like clinical depression in humans. He refused food. He refused to interact with the other chimps. And in this state of what I'm going to call grieving, he fell sick and died of some kind of internal sickness about one month after losing Flo. By this time, Fifi had given birth to her first infant. She was about 13 years old at the time. She had spent a great deal of time as a young female playing with, carrying, grooming, not only young Flint, but also the little six-month-old baby before she died. And I had been fascinated to know what kind of mother would Fifi be. It's important to say at this point that there are tremendous differences in the kind of mothering that each female gives to her child. There are, on a scale of good to bad, great differences in chimpanzee maternal behavior. And as we had predicted, Fifi was just exactly the kind of mother that her own mother had been. Affectionate, tolerant, highly protective. She allowed her infant to move away but kept a careful eye on him. When Fifi was an adolescent, she had shown great fascination for anything to do with sex. I didn't realize at the time that many adolescent females are fascinated in this way. 
and we thought Fifi was something of a nymphomaniac. Therefore, we quite naturally called this first infant Freud. <laughs> Fifi was a social female, just as Flo had been. She spent a lot of time interacting with other chimps, and she had the same kind of relaxed relationship with adult males that Flo had had. There are other young females who are very tense and nervous in their interaction with the big males. But Fifi is quite calm as she greets this adult male. And as things quiet down, little Freud totters up and is embraced as well. <coughs> Fifi, like Flo, was a playful mother, <coughs> but there were times, of course, when she didn't feel in the mood to respond to her son's attempts to initiate a game. Here you can see Freud, he's got a play face, he's reaching up, tickling his mother's chin, he's pulling at her hand, but she's just sitting and, well, no, I'm not going to play with you right now. <coughs> So Freud goes off and seeks another playmate, in this case a young baboon. We actually see a good deal of play between young chimps and young baboons, which is fascinating in view of the fact that adult male chimps may hunt, kill and eat infant baboons. Nevertheless, between youngsters, quite strong friendships may spring up, and individual chimps will seek out individual baboons, and then they will engage in quite prolonged play sessions and gentle tickling, as you see here. The youngster doesn't only spend his time playing, he also has a lot to learn. One of the things he must learn are the food feeding traditions of his particular community. And we do now know that in different areas, even when the same foods are present in both places, the chimps of one area may eat one type of food, which they don't eat in the other, and vice versa and also there are different feeding techniques. And we know that these traditions and techniques are passed on from one generation to the next through observational learning. Here Freud is looking intently at the chewed palm nut in his mother's hand. Just a hundred miles away in Mahali Mountains, south of Gombe, there are many palm trees. The chimpanzees don't eat any part of them. And then there are two using traditions to learn as well. And here Freud is watching as his mother fishes for termites, the most commonly seen tool using behavior uh, at Gombe. Of course, in the Kai forest, we have the hammer and anvil technique, where chimps pick up rocks and uh, bang open hard shelled fruits with them. We've never seen anything of this particular tool using culture at Gombe. And then there are social behaviors to learn as well. We know from experiments where chimps were brought up away from other individuals that many of the chimps' postures and gestures of communication are inborn patterns, but we know too that they have an awful lot to learn about how and when to use them, and this they must learn in a normal social setting. And so here Freud is watching very intently as another female is grooming his mother. And social grooming, as many of you probably know, is perhaps the most important social behavior that we find in chimpanzee society or other non-human primates for that matter. It's very relaxing, it helps to cement and improve friendship. During Freud's fourth year, in common with other youngsters, he went through his first really traumatic period and that was when Fifi began with increasing determination to wean him, to wean him from suckling and to wean him from riding on her back. And Freud, like many youngsters, would throw quite violent tantrums, sometimes hitting and kicking his mother, and then running off and hurling himself to the ground, screaming. And Fifi, like some other mothers, would almost always follow, gather him up, hold him in spite of his struggles and screams, and till, until he calmed. And it was as though her message could be interpreted you can't have milk, or you can't ride on my back, but I love you anyway. And gradually, during that fourth year, Freud became weaned, and so was relatively independent by the time his little brother was born. Here's Freud, five years old, 
and he was fascinated by Frodo, just as Fifi had been fascinated by her infant brother Flint and by Flo's last-born infant. Fifi was quite tolerant of Freud's attempts to play with Frodo, but when Frodo was very tiny and sleeping and Freud wanted to play with him, then Fifi would gently prevent him, not by punishing him, but by tickling him. She's giving him uh, little tickles with her lips and thus distracting him temporarily anyway from his interest in the baby. As Frodo got older, Freud was allowed to actually carry him, groom him and play with him and spent more and more time interacting with his young brother. As Frodo got older, he became an ever more active playmate and he and Freud enjoyed all kinds of romping, tumbling games. And it's very striking how different the early social experience of a second-born child is, because although Fifi had almost always responded to Freud's attempts to play, she certainly hadn't always, and it was different for Fifi too, because where she had been constantly pestered by her firstborn, who was always wanting her to play with him or groom him, now she could just sit, relax, while her youngsters chased around her or tumbled laughing nearby. One outcome of this close relationship that grew up between Freud and his young brother Frodo was that Frodo became very precocious. He had Freud not only as a playmate, but also as a role model. And often he tried to imitate the things that his elder brother did. And so when Freud, aged 10, began to leave Fifi for longer and longer periods to travel with the adult males or with sexually receptive females, then sometimes little Frodo, who was only five, went with his elder brother. Even so, Frodo still spent most of his time with Fifi, and so he was around to be a playmate and a role model. When Fifi's third child was born, Frodo again was five years old, as Freud had been, and here's Fifi's first daughter, Fanny. Frodo was fascinated by little Fanny, just as Freud had been by him, and Frodo too spent a lot of time playing with, carrying, and grooming Fanny. And we're moving on fast in time here, because we don't have 30 years to, to watch these chimps. And here's Fifi's fourth infant, another daughter. This time we called her Flocky. Fifi, with her two daughters, Fanny and Flocky. Fifi is now pregnant again with her fifth child. And here, Fifi with Fanny and Flocky. She's still pregnant. And here you can see Freud, the eldest son, although he's now almost fully adult, he's still spending time with his family. Fifi with her fifth infant, taken just a little while ago during one of my trips to Gombe. Another son, we called him Faustino. And I just couldn't get the family to pose properly for a family portrait, but to show that they still do spend a good deal of time as a close unit with friendly, supportive relationships between the various family members. Fifi, Faustino is somewhere on her lap here. And, no, sorry, here's Fifi with Faustino. You can see his hands and his feet. Here's uh, Frodo grooming his mother. She's grooming uh, Fanny. Here's Flocky. And Freud, the eldest, is just moving away. An incredibly successful female. We haven't had another female at Gombe with such reproductive success. She's had a baby like clockwork every five years. No major illnesses, no losses, no miscarriages. Quite unusual. And now the second family, Melissa. She has had a very different reproductive history. She's had one problem after the other throughout the years that I knew her. We see her here back in 1964 with her first living infant goblin. She had been pregnant before and either had a stillborn baby that we never saw or a miscarriage. And here she's looking rather puzzled at the small creature that so suddenly entered her life. 
Goblin had an uneventful childhood until he was two and a half years old, at which time Melissa was one of the victims of a paralytic disease, probably poliomyelitis, that afflicted the Gombe community. We lost many chimps, and six or seven of them were paralyzed. Melissa was affected in her neck and shoulders. And although she made an amazing recovery, for several months she walked around upright. She couldn't use her arms properly for walking. And even though eventually she learned to walk again, uh, she had a good regeneration of muscles, by the time Goblin was six years old, Melissa had not only suffered polio, she'd also had a miscarriage. But then when Goblin was six, Melissa gave birth to a healthy female infant whom we named Gremlin. Gremlin is here three years old. Goblin still part of the family playing with his young sister. She's nine here. As Goblin began to spend more and more time away from his mother, traveling with adult males, traveling with sexually receptive females, learning the kind of things that a young male must learn to take his part in adult male society. So Melissa spent quite a lot of time on her own with her daughter Gremlin. And it was because females spend so much time right away from other chimpanzees of the community that we lived at this time through four years which were among the darkest of Gombe history. It was a time when it was not safe for mothers with newborn babies, a rather asocial, strange female passion. Some of you may remember that passion developed a close, supportive relationship with her adolescent daughter, Pom, Pom who had not yet given birth. And between them, they attacked other females of the community, seized their newborn infant, killed and ate them. We actually witnessed this four times. During the four-year period, a total of 10 newborn babies disappeared, and we suspect that Passion and Pom were responsible for most or all of those deaths. Why they behaved in this way, we simply don't know. During the early part of this uh, reign of terror, Melissa gave birth to a male infant. We found him dead with his neck broken, his head bitten into, Circumstantial evidence suggested Passion had killed the baby. Nine months later, Melissa gave birth again, and when this infant was three weeks old, the attack by Passion and her daughter, Pom, was witnessed, and after 10 minutes of very fierce fighting, Melissa lost the battle. Gremlin, her daughter, had done her best to help, but Melissa, of course, had both hands occupied in trying to protect her infant, and Gremlin was only seven years old and between them, they were no match for the very strong, large passion. I wanted to spend just a few moments here to talk about Goblin and the young male's entry into the adult male dominance hierarchy. Otherwise, it would seem that I was devoting more time to females than males, which I wouldn't intend to do, uh, especially not in a place like this after Dr. Neuweiler's beginning remarks. <coughs> Adult males have very vivid, aggressive-looking patterns. They make a lot of noise. They charge around. They attract attention. Mostly, it's all bluster, noise, rather than actual attacks. Within a chimpanzee community, there are attacks. Males do attack much more than females. The attacks may look fierce. They hardly ever result in injury. The most dramatic of the male threats, and they do solve most of their disputes by threats rather than actual physical attacks, is the charging display. When the male hurtles across the ground, his hair bristling, his lips bunched, he leaps up to shake the vegetation, he sways it, he drags branches, he hurls rocks. He, in fact, makes himself look much larger and much more dangerous than he may actually be. And young males, such as Goblin, beginning to leave his mother, even before, as a matter of fact, are absolutely fascinated by these tempestuous performances. As the young male gets older, as he reaches the juvenile stage and enters adolescence, behavior that he got away with as a mere infant sometimes provokes 
a serious threat from one of the big males. So that even as the youngster is spending more time away from his mother, more time with the big males, increasingly fascinated by them, he is also increasingly apprehensive. And here Goblin bends away and screams in fear as one of the big males performs what we call a bipedal swagger, uh, clearly in a feeding context. Goblin has come too close while this big male is feeding. And sometimes the adolescent male will be actually attacked. And these attacks can look dreadful. And of course, the victim screams loudly. And there may be fear down all over the place. But as I said before, it's extremely rare that there's any wound. And after such an attack, even though the adolescent may be very, very fearful of his aggressor, he will almost always approach and adopt some kind of submissive behavior. Here, Figgin is, uh, uh, Goblin is crouching facing away from the male aggressor, who in response is reaching out with a reassurance gesture. And it's because of this pattern of approach, submission, and the resultant reassurance which usually follows, that the typical relaxed relationships are able to persist between the males of a chimpanzee community. They do not leave their communities of adolescence like so many of the non-human primates. Rather, they remain, and as a group, are responsible for protecting their territory from incursion by neighbors. And it's very important, therefore, that they should be able to maintain relaxed, friendly relationships, in spite of the fact that they will sometimes quite fiercely fight one another for social dominance. After aggressive incidents, as I said before, social grooming can be very, very important for restoring friendly, relaxed relationships. And here, five of the adult males of the community, with Goblin in the background, are grooming. Once or twice in a week, will typically move out in a group towards the periphery of the community range. And here, Goblin is traveling with such a group of males learning the kind of things that the males do on these patrols. They keep close together, they move very silently, they may climb high into a tree and stare out over what we may consider the hostile alien territory of the neighboring social group. And we do know now that they are intensely territorial. There's no time now to discuss this fascinating subject, but if two groups encounter one another, it depends on the relative size as to what will happen. If two groups with about the same number of males meet, both sides call out loudly, make an awful lot of noise, and gradually retreat to the safety of their own home ranges. If a patrolling group meets a much larger group, they will turn and flee in silence. If patrolling males encounter one or perhaps two of the neighbors, particularly if they're females, and therefore weaker, they will chase, almost hunt, one might say. And if they catch the victim, will subject her to extremely severe attacks. And these attacks, which are very often gang attacks, several males against one female, either all together or one after the other, are very unlike the kind of attacks we see between community members. These attacks may last up to 20 minutes. Goblin, age 16, managed to become the top-ranking male of his community, a position which he has only just lost. Goblin was a small chimp. He got to the top by sheer persistence. He would display towards the other males again and again and again, even if sometimes they then turned on him and attacked him and he fled, he resumed his displaying irritating, boisterous tactics the following day or at some point in the future. Here is Gremlin with one of the young males, Fifi's son Freud, just to bring the two families together here. Freud is attempting to persuade Gremlin to go off with him on what we call a consort trip. When a female is in estrus, she may be surrounded and mated by all the males in her community. A high-ranking male may inhibit other males from mating with her and keep her for a large part to himself. But any male, if he's smart enough, can persuade a female to leave the other males 
and follow him out to the periphery of the home range. If he tries this before she becomes really interesting to be big, high-ranking males, he can succeed in sharing an infant, even if he's young or old or crippled. Well, Freud is young. This is one of his first attempts at consortship. Gremlin absolutely doesn't want to go with him. She's resisting as much as she dares, and Freud is getting increasingly agitated, leaping up and shaking and swaying the branches, his hair bristling more and more. And here, well, you know, give me a break, can't you? I don't want to come. She seemed to my way of thinking, to push her luck as much as she could. And just when I thought that Freud would actually attack her, and he is bigger than she is, even though it doesn't look it here, at the last minute, she capitulated and followed him off along the beach towards the northern part of the community range. She followed him very slowly. She kept stopping. He had to keep waiting, 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 shaking branches, shaking branches. But eventually, he took her along the beach and established a little consort range where he would probably have liked to keep her for the next 10 days throughout her estrus period when he might have had a chance of sharing a child. But Freud lacked experience. Gremlin managed to escape and the following day returned triumphantly to where she wanted to be and Freud trailed in a little after. I think those few slides have given you some feeling for how different chimpanzee family life can be, what different kinds of experiences young chimps can go through, how utterly fascinating it is, why I'm still there after so many years, and why I want to stay for many more, because we're continually learning three new things. Melissa left three healthy youngsters. Fifi, as I've said, had an amazing reproductive record. Many females at Gombe die having raised only two or less youngsters to full reproductive maturity. Chimpanzees, unlike humans, and here's one way they do differ from us, are not at all robust breeders. And the most a mother could probably have and raise to full reproductive maturity is five. I very much doubt if Fifi will better her current record. There has been no major population expansion at Gombe in the 30 years that I've been there. True, there have been rises in numbers, but then something like an epidemic or a, a conflict between neighboring groups has served to reduce the numbers to their original level. Gombe is very tiny, as I said. It's only 30 square miles. There are only about 160 chimps in three social groups in the park. Cultivation has now come right up to the boundary. There are hundreds of fishermen camped along the beaches, and tourists are moving in, all with the possibility of bringing in diseases, and chimps do catch all known human contagious diseases. However, in spite of this, in spite of the worry about the long-term success of the Gombe population, because 150, 160 is not many for a gene pool, and they are now isolated from all others. In spite of that, they're safe from poaching. The plight of chimpanzees in so many parts of Africa is truly grim. They're disappearing fast. We've just succeeded in getting the United States to reclassify them as in an endangered species, under the American Endangered Species Act, which gives them a little more protection. They're already on Appendix 1 in CITES, but this doesn't pr prevent their wholesale destruction in many countries. They've gone from four African countries where they were present in their thousands at the turn of the century. They're almost gone from five others. They'll probably become extinct in four more. In fact, there are only four countries in the central part of the range, Gabon, Cameroon, uh, um, Congo, and Zaire, where they are present in really large, healthy numbers. And even there, the rate of decline is, is horrifying. This is all because of habitat destruction 
as human populations spread, cultivate the ground, and as timber companies move in to cut down the forest to sell for furniture and whatever else timber companies sell it for. And I've been in some of these forests and seen these trucks with these beautiful huge trees suntering down the forest road. Very sad to see when you've actually watched it with your own eyes. In some African countries, chimpanzees are hunted for food, Zaire, Congo, Liberia, many others. And in many countries, mothers are selectively shot, whether they're eaten or not, so that babies can be sold. Babies may be sold as pets, and very often people feeling sorry for these pathetic, dehydrated, sunken-eyed little infants will buy them and try to rescue them. Infants are sold to dealers, and dealers in turn will sell them for entertainment or for biomedical research. It's not only cruel, catching baby chimps, it's very wasteful. We estimate that at least 10, on average, individuals will die for every baby that reaches its final destination, wherever that may be in the world, alive. And that, of course, is because some mothers, and they're shot usually with rather inefficient old weapons, some mothers will be wounded, creep away, and die later, along with their infants. Some infants will be killed at the same time as their mothers. Other infants, even if they're captured, alive, will be so traumatized and so shocked, and there's not anyone, usually, who has any good idea of their nutritional needs that they die on the way to the dealer and often their wrists are tied with rope or wire and they're put in tiny boxes or they will die subsequently uh, on the way to wherever they're going. Chimpanzees are indeed our closest living relatives. I think most of you here know that their DNA and ours differs by only just over 1%. It's because of physiological similarities between chimps and humans that they are used and perceived as useful models for scientists engaged in research on various kinds of infectious diseases like hepatitis, leprosy, malaria, and now AIDS. It's a bit unfortunate that scientists have been less eager to recognize the equally striking similarities that exist between us and chimps in the sphere of social behavior and intellect and emotions. You've seen illustrated this evening some of the ways in which chimps are like us behaviorally, in the close affectionate bonds that last between family members, in some of the nonverbal communication patterns like kissing, embracing, holding hands, chimps are capable of real altruism. One example, a three and a quarter year old infant lost his mother, he had no close relatives, he was adopted and looked after by a 12 year old non-related adolescent male, looked after for a whole year and that male actually saved the little infant's life. In the realm of cognition, chimpanzees show intellectual abilities that we used to think were completely unique to humans. Again, there isn't time to provide details, but they can reason, they can solve simple problems, they can, to some extent, plan for the immediate future. They certainly have very good memories. They are capable of intentional communication with each other. They can understand and use abstract symbols in their communication, for example, Many chimps now, at least eight, have been taught up to 300 signs of the American Sign Language of the Deaf, where this, for example, will mean tree, drink, candy. And they can use these signs in novel combinations to communicate not only with their trainers, but also to some extent with each other. I think that the more we've learned over the years, both in the wild and in the lab, about chimpanzees, has shown us that the line that we used to perceive as such a distinct line between humans on the one hand 
and non-humans on the other, is in fact becoming blurred. The more we learn about chimpanzees, the more we understand about our own place in nature. We are unique, of course, as a primate, and perhaps the way in which we differ most is in the fact that we develop the spoken language. We have a far more developed intellect. We're far more capable of understanding the effects of what we do. And this is why knowing what we know about the chimpanzee, you can understand, I think, why I'm spending increasingly more time traveling around, trying to help conservation efforts in Africa and trying to help those who are striving to create better conditions in the labs and zoos, trying to abolish chimpanzees in circuses, to abolish this use of smuggled infant chimpanzees in Spain, where photographers dress them in children's clothes, lure tourists and take photos. Those chimps are drugged, burned with cigarettes and beaten. I've been into medical research labs in Washington and Austria where chimpanzees are imprisoned in cages smaller than this, this podium, and where adult chimpanzees in a standard cage that is five foot by five foot and seven foot high may spend their entire 50 years. And these chimpanzees are treated worse than we treat our criminals. They're not only innocent of crime, they're actually being used to help us alleviate human suffering. We, with our highly developed intellect, with our spoken language, are capable of greater evil than our closest living relatives. We're also capable of greater good. I want to end with one short story, which I know some of you have heard. But for me, it's such a symbolic story, and I haven't yet found a better one. It's about a chimp in captivity named Old Man, who was rescued from a lab when he was about 12. And it's about a young human keeper called Mark. Old Man was put on an island with two females. And when Mark was employed by the zoo in America, he was told, don't go anywhere near those chimps. They hate people. They're vicious. They'll try to kill you. The chimps lived on a man-made island surrounded by a moat. So at first, Mark used to take food towards the island in his little boat and throw it onto the shore. But he watched the chimps. He saw how they would hug one another and kiss with excitement when the food approached. He saw how gentle old man was with the baby, his baby, that had been born to one of the females. And he thought, how can I look after these amazing beings if I don't have some kind of good relationship with them? He began going closer and closer. One day he actually held out a fruit. An old man took it from his hands. One day he ventured onto the shore. And eventually he was able to groom and even play with old man. And then one day, Mark accidentally slipped, fell on his face, frightened the baby who screamed. The baby's mother instantly leapt to the defense of her child, as chimpanzee mothers will, and bit Mark in the neck. He felt blood running down his chest. The other two females were free by then. Both joined their companion. One bit his arm, one bit his leg. They thought he'd had it. But what happened? Old man came charging up to the rescue of this first human friend, the first friend he'd had in years. And he physically pulled the three females off Mark and hurled them away. And he stayed close by while Mark managed to drag himself to safety. And later when Mark came out of hospital, I was talking to him and he said, you know, Jane, there's no question. Old man saved my life. And this is why I think it's such a symbolic story for us. Because if a chimpanzee and a chimpanzee who's been abused by humans can reach across this species gap to help a human friend in time of need, then surely we, with our greater capacity for understanding and our greater intellect, can also reach out to help chimpanzees in their time of need. 
Thank you. Thank you.